you. This is KTN News. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us here on KTN Primetime News. With me, Akisa Wandera. Let's get on to other news. As Kenya Airways ready to launch their Nairobi, New York direct flights on Monday next week. We visited Boeing, the world's largest aviation company that manufactured the plane that will be used in the inaugural flight. Alex Chamwara of Charms Media will tell us the whole story at 10.30 p.m. on this week's episode of Chamwada Report. Stay tuned for that. Well, and of course, as we look forward to that story, it was an emotional send-off as relatives and friends of the late Sarova Hotel's chairman, Mohinda Vohra, uh, gathered during his cremation and that of three other members of the family. The four were cremated this afternoon at the Hindu Shamshan Bumi crematorium in Nairobi's Karyoko area. The four died on Sunday in a road accident at Makindu along Mombasa Nairobi Highway. Others who died in the accident were his wife, daughter, daughter rather, and daughter-in-law. The deceased were traveling from Makindu in Makueni County where they had attended a memorial service for Vohra's son who died in another road accident last Last year, among those who attended the cremation ceremony were politicians, members of the Rai family, and businessman Manu Chandaria. <laughs> Now, for many smokers, smoking is just a way of relieving stress, but unbeknownst to many is that the relaxing nicotine chemical from that single puff doesn't just harm the lungs and the heart. It also places smokers at a high risk of having their limbs amputated. Mary Mwoki tells us the story of tobacco victims who have turned out to be anti-smoking champions. Take a look. This is Richard Kanyoro at Ward 4B at Kenyatta National Hospital. Kanyoro's legs were amputated just below the knee last year. But today, he is a man on a mission. He is offering moral support to Patrick Musioki, who just had both his legs amputated. Musioki has been a chain smoker for the last five years. <laughs> On the next bed lies 53-year-old John Maura, who is scheduled to undergo an operation to remove his toe. Maura, too, has been a chain smoker for the last 30 years. He developed a festering wound that refused to heal, even after several doses of medication. Eventually, he sought treatment at this facility, only to be told that his toe had to go. According to medics, years of smoking had caused blood clots in his feet, effectively cutting circulation to his feet, his toe bearing the brunt of it all. Ni kushikana kwa misiba, misizi, yani veins, sabu ya vutaji wa sikana, asa inayanda inakua, ina, ina broko. Na yode imenireta hapa, na hatari kwa sababu naona watu wata wanapoteza hata viungo zao za mwiri, miguzi inayanda, vidore zinayanda, Dr. Naomi Keba says that over 75% of the amputations they undertake are related to smoking. Keba says that continued smoking does not only put one at risk of heart disease, but also greatly increases the chances of losing one or both legs due to amputation. When this blood vessel scars, it will narrow. Once this narrowing happens, blood supply is decreased, to the legs, as you saw most of them. They had what you call gangrene. Once that sets in, the only thing we can do is 
amputate. Patients who have been informed of an impending amputation by the doctor go through a difficult period and are often faced with the devastating realization that their life will never be the same again. <laughs> Rose Njoroge is a counseling psychologist at the Kenyatta National Hospital and knows only too well the anguish she sees in her patients. They don't have the ribs, uh, one or the two. So kind of they get into depression because losing a rib is just losing part of your body. So they have loss and grief. They have they start getting into depression. But when there is proper follow up and counseling, they accept and they're able to to see life in a better perspective. And I as simple as walking is a pleasure that Musioki and others whose legs have been amputated can no longer enjoy. Smoking has been termed as a preventable cause of mortality, with studies showing that smokers have a higher chance of developing type 2 diabetes. Therefore, quitting smoking is a cost-effective way of preventing illness. Mary Mwoki, KTN News. Thank you, Mary. Now, the walkout on President Uhuru Kenyatta by seven legislators from Bomet County on Monday only an after the simmering political tension and backroom politics within the ruling party jubilee, while majority of legislators from the Rift Valley region pile pressure on the president to pronounce himself on who will be his automatic successor, especially after the handshake, the president appears to be only keen on building his legacy. Our senior political affairs reporter, Chris Tyru, looks at whether Jubilee will hold until 2022. Uhuru Ruto to rule for 20 years. That was the rallying call from the president during his first term in office as both the president and his deputy <laughs> enjoyed a close political and working relationship. But as the 2022 general election draws closer, the more it is becoming evident that there is more than meets the eye. And the walkout on President Uru Kenyatta by MPs from Bomet County seems to be a tip of the iceberg. Bomet was even more so unfortunate because it just shows the kind of attitude that some of my colleagues in Jubilee have, especially from the River Valley. Because what you see is people who who are trying to make a point. I have had the argument that they were actually uh, making the point against Governor Laboso, but that wasn't Governor Laboso's function. It was uh, the president's function. The president has been facing outright pressure to publicly endorse his deputy as his automatic successor. Uru is finishing his term. They are busy pushing for William Ruto to be president. Is that how they want us to treat William Ruto when he becomes president? Would they want us to walk out of, of a function from him when he was president? So they need to respect the president so that the same respect that they dish out is always going to be dished out to their candidate should he become president. Uh, Uhuru is really keen on the meeting some you know, election campaign pledges. He's keen on some legacy. He wants to finish his term with something. So he will want everybody, he wants Relo Dinge, he wants everybody on, on board. But that's not occurring well with, with the Ruto team. And the new found working relationship between the president and opposition chief, Raila Odinga, seemed to have complicated matters in the Jubilee party, given that the push for reforms and possible referendum. Because of that, there's a feeling that Raila Odinga is way closer and the effect politically that Ruto wanted to achieve has been watered down. However, those who support Ruto's presidential ambitions from the Mount Kenya region seem undeterred. Those people who are purporting uh, to start uh, against uh, the DP currently, ask, go to their constituencies, ask Raya. They know what they, are say, what they are doing is against the grain so far as ground is concerned. There is no way, even if we all commit to vote for D D William Ruto today, four years is such a long time, things will have changed. So when I see them in this uh, frantic effort to run a campaign for the deputy president and get people committing to support him now, I'm asking myself, what is wrong with them? But despite the political undertones in the Jubilee party, the deputy president has managed to paint a picture of a more united and formidable force ready to face any opposition come 2022. If history is anything to go by, 2022 will see new political formations. 
there is every chance that Jubilee will not be there, ODM will not be there, NASA will not be there. We'll have different formations. We have seen in the recent times, we have seen uh, uh, Wetangula and Ruto looking like they want to work closely. And as the deputy president continues to put his eyes on the ball, while his boss focuses on his legacy, Jubilee party faces the ultimate test of unity before the 2022 general election. Chris Dairo, KTN News. And still on politics, Nairobi County could be staring at a looming constitutional crisis for lack of a deputy governor and a proper speaker of the county assembly in the event Governor Sonko is unable to occupy office for any reason whatsoever. Questions have been raised as to why neither the Senate or, nor the Jubilee Party leadership have failed to compel the governor to nominate his deputy. At the moment, two speakers are claiming to be bona fide speaker, and according to Nairobi Senator Johnson Sakaja, Governor Sonko will be summoned to appear before the Senate and explain why he has failed to name a deputy governor 10 months after the exit of Polycarp Igade. For 10 months now, Nairobi County has been operating without a deputy governor following the dramatic resignation of Polycarp Igade in January. I'm on the run. Media, the governor also took off shifting his operation base to his Mua home in the neighboring Machakos County, claiming his life was in danger. And on September 6, Nairobi County MCS impeached Speaker Beatrice Elachi, and as she moved to court obtaining stay orders, the Assembly elected an acting Speaker. Article 182 of the Constitution is explicit when a vacancy occurs in the office of the County Governor in that it is the deputy who shall assume office for the remainder of the term. And if a vacancy occurs in the office of the governor and that of the deputy county governor, then the speaker of the county assembly shall act as the county governor. <laughs> However, as it stands, Nairobi County has no deputy governor. While the initially elected speaker was impeached and moved to court to stay the move, only for MCS to elect an acting speaker the big question is, between the two, who can take charge in case of any eventuality now that Nairobi County lacks a deputy? Why is the Senate silent over the issue as Nairobi stares at a looming constitutional crisis? The, the Supreme Court had already given a, a, a ruling. Um, what we did in the Senate is to go and uh, actually legislate on it. Um, that bill has been lying in the National Assembly about how that is done. And so that, is, that has been given the governor of Nairobi an excuse um, to, you know, dilly-dally on this issue, to have some lethargy because of the fears that if you get a good deputy, maybe you'll be impeached and then that deputy takes over because of this, uh, you know, people that he claims have been fighting him. And he must expedite on it. Nairobi Senator Johnson Sakaja says the prevailing crisis is deliberate creation by selfish individuals and Senate Devolution Committee is stepping in. They'll possibly be inviting him um, to come uh, before uh, the, the Senate and explain that situation. But beyond just uh, the arms of you know, the Senate and the court CTC, Jubilee has political leadership, you know, and we're asking the party to actually come in and, and, and sort out this matter. Because these positions are not for any individual, they're for the people of Nairobi. When the MCS kicked out then Speaker Elachi, they also gave the governor 14 days to nominate his deputy. A matter Sonko laughed off, saying they rejected his main nominee, Miguna Miguna. In as much as I respect the Nairobi County Assembly and the members of the Nairobi County Assembly, Mimi Sita Kubali intimidation from anybody from any member. President Uhuru Kenyatta is on record calling out the governor over his leadership. Wanainchi wa Nairobi wa mechoka. Na governor Sonko atawe mwenyewe unajua ya kuamba tuliahidi. Wanainchi wa Nairobi ya kuamba wakitupatia na fasi sisi kama wanajubili kuongoza jiji hii tutabadilisha maisha ya wanainchi the expectations are high. The goodwill is still there, but it is waning. If, if, if things are not done, you know, the, the people will get tired of waiting. Um, I know he has good intentions, um, but uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It must be good actions that we need to see. And I want to thank the president and the national government for coming in 
to sort out many of the problems in the city. For 10 months now, Nairobi County remains without a deputy governor. In case of any eventuality, which of the speakers can take charge given that one has been impeached and is in court fighting for her own statement, while MCS, on the other hand, have elected one of their own, calling him the acting speaker. That is the story of county number 47, the capital county. Duncan Haimba, KTA News. Now, a section of northern Kenyan le Kenya leaders have marked the government and the Ministry of Education for lowering entry grades for those seeking to join colleges to pursue teaching courses. Wajir East Member of Parliament Rashid Amin says the poor performance recorded in the region was as a result of lack of adequate teachers. The MP says the new requirements will now give youth in the area an opportunity to enter teachers' training colleges. This is our field that those interventions and those gazettements which have been done by the ministry are in the right direction, are in the best interest of the people of the region, and they are likely to improve the, the number of teachers available to our students. Currently, we have lack of teachers, and the kind of teaching we have are very poor quality. So, availing high number of teachers which are trained in our government institutions will be able to alleviate the current problem we have been ongoing for the past years. Moving on, Deputy President William Druto has expressed his dissatisfaction with the quality of education offered by some institutions of higher learning in the country. Druto has critiqued institutions focusing on the growth of the number of students at the expense of offering quality learning. The DP has also weighed in on the national examination issues set to officially kick off next week. Ibrahim Karanja now reports. Deputy President William Ruto, who was speaking in Embu County during the launch of the endowment funds for the University of Embu, put in notice universities intent on making a kill through high number of students. The same way we changed the funding framework from a subjective assessment to student numbers determining how much a university receives as capitation from government. Going into the future, we are going to enhance that formula to include relevance in the courses that are taught in the university and the quality of graduates that come from that university. Ruto challenged universities to follow up and know the fate of their students after graduation. And if a university is busy churning out graduates who end up roasting maize, <laughs> then they don't deserve public resources. Yes. I mean, a university should be ashamed that their graduate is roasting maize by the roadside. And if they, have, they are not, then there is something wrong. We must avoid in our universities the temptation to be a jack of all trades and a master of none because that's what's going on the deputy president also took issue with the undue pressure piled on candidates during the national examinations we must cultivate the culture that acquisition of knowledge acquisition of skills and acquisition of competences is what will define a society these sentiments were directed to a society which oftentimes measures one's success with their performance in the final examinations. For a very long time, we have run a system, an education system, that focuses on passing examination. And that system has actually generated and condemned a lot of our children to failure. Ibrahim Karanja, KTN News. 
Thank you, Ibrahim, for that report. Now, Baringo Senator Gideon Moy has raised concern over the increased ceilings in the recurrent expenditure of 14 counties for the financial year 2018-2019. While contributing to the statement request in the plenary of the Senate, members expressed displeasure in the manner in which the national government has been overburdening the counties with expenditure caps. There is nobody over-regulating the national government. The current government is a government like the national government. We have two governments according to Article 6 of the Constitution. The national government, the current government, dependent, interdependent. But we have a situation where one level of government is loading over the other on a daily basis. When it comes to the current and development expenditure of counties, the PFM Act requires that at least 70% must go develop uh, recurrent and 30, uh, not more than 70 and, and, 30, and we can never know. In fact, it, we have been unable, unable to reach that uh, level, but where it's desirable. But I don't understand, I don't understand when someone says that we have exceeded shareable revenues. I don't share revenues are figures are in billions. To the farms now, Kajedu County is one of the dry counties in the country and the leading economic activities, pastoralism, and tucked in the heart of Aryan Kao village, some six kilometers from Sultan Hamoud, is a sanctuary of breeding dopa sheep. The farm belongs to Mze Paul Nagiskie, a leading dopa breeder in the country. On this week's episode of The Next Frontier, Philip Keitani visited Mze Paul and tells us more on that. Transform Kenya, empower our nation. If you drive deep into the bushes of a Rankau village some six kilometers from Sultan Hamud, this is what welcomes you. This is Mze Paul Nagisekie Homestead, and here there are more than 300 dopa sheep, and this morning, Mze Paul was performing some basic animal husbandry on his flock. Miaka kama 44 nimekuwa tu nikifuga dopa. Ilianza tu na kuondoa sa kienyeji nikaja kubadilisha. Mze Paul tells me it has taken him a lifetime to improve his dopa sheep which is currently one of the best breeds in the continent where he is currently sourcing his breed from South Africa and he even believes that he has some of the best breeds than most farmers in South Africa and is now looking to getting his next breed from Australia. Kila mwaka naleta kondoo moja. Na huko South Africa tunapewa mbegu kulingana na breed vile iko. For Mze Paul, despite the growing demand for mutton in Kenya, his breeds are not for the slaughterhouse. His farm is a dopa breeding farm. Madume yote kwa ajili ya tufinyi, tunatenga. Alafu hizi, iso, iso, iso madume yote inakuwa ya mbegu. According to Mze Paul, dopa sheep performs well in semi-arid areas. They have a high lumping percentage and can breed every eight months. They lump easy and are excellent mothers. Mara nyingi tuna, eh, tunapata mabacha mbili paka tatu. Mze Paul tells me the most effective step to improve profitability of any sheep breed is to improve the husbandry. Mze Paul also insists that to avoid inbreeding, it is crucial that farmers practice ram rotation. This can be achieved by exchanging rams or buying from other farms every one year or one and a half years. In the recent past, dopa sheep has become an animal of choice for small-scale farmers, ranchers, breeders and abattoir operators. This is because this breed of sheep are easy to care for, grow fast and yield juicy ribs and chops. After 40 years of patience, Mze Paul has been able to improve his dopa breeds to one of the best breeds in the country. For example,